Our gospel lesson comes from the 19th chapter of Matthew, verses 16 through 26. Then someone came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Often when I begin a sermon, and it's hard when you're writing a sermon to figure out how to start it. Sometimes you come back and do the beginning at the end. Sometimes I'll start with a story. Sometimes I'll start with a joke. Sometimes even a pithy theological quote. But last week I announced that this was going to be a three-week sermon series on stewardship, which is how we manage our assets as our response to God's grace. So this morning there is no way to address stewardship or how we respond without addressing first the elephant in the room or on the parking lot, as the case may be. God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. How many of you sort of cringed when you heard that story? You know that story, and it's just one that is very hard to hear. And it seems like a contradiction to last week's lesson from the prophet Micah, the conversation before, between God and the people of Judah. God was saying, what have I done to you? And demanding the response, God said, answer me. What have I done to you that you would treat me this way? And the response becomes then an internal dialogue with the people amongst themselves. With what shall I come before the Lord? Shall I offer the firstborn of my body for the sin of my soul? No. What does God require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. So take your beloved son and offer him as a burnt sacrifice, hardly just or kind, or even an example of humility. In this age that we live in now, which is an age of religious extremism, we cannot overstate this. The idea of child sacrifice or human sacrifice of any kind which at that time was happening in other faith traditions as well as some of the kings of Israel who had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord, they were offering their children as burnt offerings. The idea of human sacrifice is abhorrent to God, and it is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you hear nothing else today, hear that. God does not want you to burn your children as an offering to God. And this is stated throughout the prophets and the law. In Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, for the people of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house that is called by my name, defiling it. And they go on building the high places to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. From the prophet Ezekiel, when you offer your gifts and make your children pass through the fire, which means that you're sacrificing them, you defile yourselves with your idols to this day. And even the Torah, the law, the five books of Moses from Leviticus, you shall not give any of your offspring to sacrifice them and so profane the name of your God, punctuated with I am the Lord. So if child sacrifice is so abhorrent to God, why would God test Abraham in this way? We're going to come back to that, I promise. But first let's look at the story that we read about the rich young man in one of the Gospels referred to as a rich young ruler. We don't know how rich he was. We don't know if he was a ruler of any kind. We just know that he had a lot of money and a lot of possessions. And he comes to Jesus 
which implies that he considers Jesus to be a teacher, a knowledgeable man from God, and he says, what must I do? What good deed must I do? What must I accomplish? Jesus says, keep the commandments. Pretty simple, straightforward, right? But then he says, which one? Jesus is thinking to himself, I'm sure, don't you know the Ten Commandments? He doesn't list them all, but what does he say? Thou shalt not commit murder. The man thinks, ooh, I do that. I don't, I don't murder anybody. Adultery, oh, I'm good there. Do not steal, check. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor, check. Honor your father and your mother. Love your neighbors yourself. And he's thinking, I do all that. I must be doing pretty well. And then Jesus sort of drops the bomb on him and says, oh, there's just one thing more. Sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then follow me. Apparently, this man loved his possessions, his stuff, more than his neighbor or himself. Because what does he do? He goes away grieving. He's grieving. He cannot give up anything, and he walks away. I'm going to warn you that there's a lot of bad theology circulating about this passage and a lot of bad sermons, of which I hope this is not one of the worst you'll ever hear. But there are so many misinterpretations of this passage, and one has formed the basis of what is called the prosperity gospel, which is promoted by certain televangelists who shall go nameless this morning because once I said something and I mentioned something by name and people left my congregation because they said, how dare you speak so ill of a godly man? But if anyone tells you that if you obey the commandments, that God will bless you by making you rich, that is nowhere to be found in the Bible, in the word of God, in the teachings of Christ. It is not there. You are not being blessed with wealth as a, at a boy, at a girl, way to go. That is not what we are about here. God does not bless us with stuff, although everything we have is from God's hand, and we give thanks to that. And then there's the part about the eye of the needle. Every time I have preached this passage, someone has come up to me and said, now you don't understand. I have been to Jerusalem. I have taken the tour. And my tour guide said to me, this gate right here in the wall is the, the gate that is called the eye of the needle. And all you have to do is get your camel to bend down to get through it, or all you have to do is unload your camel. I hate to disabuse you of that, but that is just simply not true. That is something that was developed hundreds of years ago, but again, a century after the death and the resurrection of Christ. What Jesus is saying is you can't take your stuff into heaven with you. It's not going to work sort of freaks out the disciples there, don't you think? Because Jesus is talking to them, and they're horrified because they're saying, Lord, if, if, if you can't get into heaven that way, who can get into heaven? And the word that Jesus answers with, the same words that the angel Jerry Beard said to Mary, the virgin, Melissa, well, you know, Gabriel and Mary, not Jerry and Melissa, but with God, Nothing is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Um, what he tells them in that statement is that it's about relying on God's grace. You can't get a checkoff list and say, oh, I didn't do this, I didn't do this. Oh, yes, I did this, I did this. I'm in, I'm good, I'm ready to go. It can't be about what you have or what you lack. It is about God's grace alone. But that's the grace that calls for a faithful response. That's what stewardship is about, a faithful response to God based on what God has done for us. So let's go back and look at Abraham for a minute. because That story, I'm still, blah, it gets me every time I read it. I have wrestled with this one for my entire ministry. I've wrestled with this with parishioners. I've wrestled with this with people who cannot come to faith because of this very passage of Scripture. The name Isaac, you know what Isaac means, right? You remember that from your VBS days? Itzach means laughter. Why does it mean laughter? Because Abraham was older than dirt, and his wife was just right behind him, 
And God says, guess what, people? You're going to have a baby. Sarah's the first one to just burst out in laughter. Because let's face it, she is way post-menopause at this point, and she has been told that she's going to have a son through whom God will bless the whole earth. What would you do? I would laugh hysterically myself if I didn't pass out first. Abraham later himself laughs at the notion of this. You need to know the whole story to understand this particular passage, because taken alone, this passage is as scary as it sounds. But Abraham is called by God, and three times in the story we read today, Abraham says, you know, when he's called, here I am. God calls him, here I am. His son calls him, here I am, here I am. When God first called Abraham, you've got to remember, Abraham, the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Abraham, the first of the Jewish patriarchs, the one who didn't know anything about this God he was calling. God says to him, he's sitting on the porch, he's got his feet up, he's retired, he's wealthy, he's got lands, he's got herds, he's got people, he's got a good life, he just has one thing lacking, he has no heir. And God says, Abraham, get up and go. And Abraham says, yes, Lord, yes, and he gets up and goes. An amazing thing. I can't imagine that kind of response of faithfulness to a God who is not known to the people at this time. And he is promised. He's taken out. He says, look at the sky, Abraham. Look at the stars. You can't even count the stars, can you? We're not talking a place with a lot of lights that obliterate the stars. Can you imagine? Have you ever been in a place that is totally dark what the sky looks like at night? He says, your descendants are more numerous than them. And if you've been to Ocean City and you've walked on the beach and you've taken your shoes off and dumped about half a pound of sand out, he says, look at the sand, the grains of sand on along the shore. Your descendants will outnumber these. That's quite the promise. But Abraham, he's getting a little tired. He's getting a little old. He's getting older and older and older, and the promise hasn't happened yet. Then these hysterically weird passages that happen where he's traveling through foreign lands, and twice he passes Sarah off as his sister, who then is taken by the king into his harem. Apparently, Sarah at 100 is a pretty, pretty good-looking girl, I guess. And in both instances, the foreign ruler says, why would you do this? Why would you lie to me like this? Take your wife. Ooh, I'm not trying to mess up your family. Because Abraham had doubted the promise. And then in the ultimate doubting of the promise, what does he do? Sarah says, it's not going to happen. Let's give it up. God must mean another way, even though God had said, from you and your wife shall come this child. So she calls Hagar, her servant, and gives her to Abraham as a concubine. And she conceives and bears Ishmael, who then is cast out because Sarah is jealous. But finally the promise comes, and Isaac is born. I really don't think the test was to see if Abraham's faith would let him sacrifice his only son. The test was to see if he finally could trust the promise. And he trusted the promise. I don't think God had any intention along the story And I think Abraham had learned enough that God's word is true. God's word is faithful. We just need to be faithful in response. And we don't know how old Abraham and Isaac were in the story. We know Abraham was older, but we don't know what condition he was in, if he was still hale and hearty, even at the age that he had acquired. We don't know if Isaac was a little boy at this time or a teenager who could have easily overpowered his father but we know that he picks up the wood and puts it on his back and carries it. So for Christians, this becomes a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ who will pick up his own cross and will walk up the hill because he trusted God completely. He trusted God, his father, completely. And Isaac trusts his father completely. And through Isaac, the promise will be fulfilled. And God provides a ram. I can't imagine how Abraham felt when he heard his son say to him, I see the fire and the knife, but where is the lamb for the slaughter? Not knowing that on some level it was him. That's why Jews read this story and they focus on God's providence, the fact that God will provide no matter what. God will always provide. I said a few weeks ago before we started this series that The faith that we have in Jesus Christ is about transformation and incarnation. 
this passage I said has kept people away from the church, away from God, because people see that God is a monster in this story, that God isn't a child abuser, that God is a murderer, that God is despicable. I've heard all these words. I've read these words, but I've also heard these words. I led this study once that had this passage in it. It was an interesting group. It was mostly elderly ladies, a former heroin dealer, and an agnostic, almost atheist young woman who said to me, I can't stand this God of yours. If he would require this to prove love, who would want to worship him? But I tell you what, I have prayed this passage so many times, and what I see again and again is the promise of God that is sure and certain and reliable. And God is asking Abraham if he believes the promise, and he says yes. And I even had this young woman who said this had kept her from faith, saying that gives me something new to think about, not just that God wants to kill children. The question then becomes for us, if we look at these two passages together, what someone was willing to do when God says, there's just one more thing that you must do. How will we respond? Will we respond by saying, God, if you give me a list and I can check things off and they're easy and doable, I will follow you. Or we can throw caution to the wind and trust that the God who provides, the God who makes all things possible, God's grace is sufficient to take us to life eternal. That's what Jesus said to those disciples. You will be blessed by life in this world that is abundant the way you've never known it, and you will be blessed with life eternal. But we're called to respond. I think the passage is today some of stewardship in a different way. It's not about how you spend your money. It's not about how you spend your money. I'm not going to ask you to turn in. There was a church in Hedgesville, West Virginia, called Independent Bible Church, biggest church anywhere on the horizon, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. They had probably 800 people a week worshiping there, but they had very few members. Because in order to become a member, you know what you had to do? You had to give them your tax return. I'm not making it up, people. You gave them your tax return, and they told you what your offering would be, which is why they had very few members. That's not what God is asking of us, but God is asking us to respond. It's not about how you spend your money. It's not even about how you spend your time. It's about how you spend yourself. What are you willing to give to God? What can't you give that you have to withhold? Those are the questions for us. Jesus gave himself for the sake of the world, and if you want to follow him, That does mean picking up either the bundle of wood to put on your back or your cross and you follow. But one of the things I like most about this passage is that when the young man walks away, Jesus lets him go without recrimination, without judgment, without saying, come back, let me try another way, which is what we do in the church, isn't it? We say, okay, if this program doesn't work, we'll try this program, we'll try that program. We'll try to make Christianity so palatable to everyone that they come rushing to us. It's not about that. It's about responding to grace with the giving of self. But we have the choice. We can either give as we can, or we can walk away grieving. I hope that we all give as we can. To the ministries and mission of this church, you have been so very faithful. You've seen us through this pandemic and beyond. But it's not about the money. It's about giving away yourself. How much are you willing to give to Jesus Christ? Will you trust in his promise? Will you know that with him all things are possible? Will you respond with all that you have and all that you are? Or will you go away grieving? It's quite a question. May God give us the grace to pick up our cross and to follow, no matter where Christ leads, trusting that we will arrive fully in the kingdom and in life eternal. Don't wait until you're dead to experience the beauty and the power and the grace of God's kingdom. The moment you understand the depth of God's love for you in Jesus Christ, the moment you understand that he alone makes this possible, your life will change and you will no longer grieve. You will always rejoice. The glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.